Yes. So, uh, good morning, everybody, uh, to our today's session, to our today Austrian Technology Day session for Southeast Asia. Topic is traffic management for smart cities. As you already know, we already it, it's already the third day of our of this Austrian Technologies uh, Technology Days here in Southeast Asia with six countries, and we are very proud that it was really working out very well during the last two days. So today is the last day. Just let me mention one very massive thing. We had more than 130 uh, business to business meetings already. So keep on discussing, keep on meeting people, keep on meeting your future business contacts. So what you can see in the background is uh, today's uh, stream or, or today's session program. We will have two keynotes on an overview on traffic management from Dr. Non and then from Dr. Lies, Austrian technology for traffic management, which will be followed by a panel discussion. And after that, the B2B meetings will take place as a kind of closing of the session. Interpretation is again available in uh, Thai and Vietnamese. So please use the appropriate channels for that. It will work out well. And just to uh, get to know you with us, with the hosting team for today, my name is Christian Frey. I'm the head of business and innovation at the Austrian Research Promotion Agency. And with me to uh, my co-host today is Alexander Kiefer. You can also see him in the picture and he will later on lead the panel discussion. So thanks a lot, Alexander. Thanks a lot, everybody, for being here. Have a warm welcome. And I think we prepared quite an interesting program. To start up with, I will hand over now to Alexander, to you, to give us a short introduction on Textport, which is the thing that is the baseline for those Austrian Technology Day Southeast Asia. Please. Thank you, Christian. Yes, hello from my side, Alexander Kiefer, my name. Uh, before we start, a few words on the Austrian Textport Initiative, which aims to promote Austrian technologies internationally. It is planned and managed by the Austrian Federal Ministry, BMK, and the Austrian Research Promotion Agency. And Austrian technology providers can register on our online platform, textport.at, and present their innovative solutions via so-called technology profiles. It is a showcase of roughly 600 Austrian solutions right now, uh, still growing across all technology sectors and worth the visit. Apart from the, the online platform, uh, we regularly organize uh, online events or on-site events like these, Austrian Technology Days, and where we focus uh, on specific technology requests from countries all over the world and try to match solution providers with those who are looking for uh, technologies in the field of, for example, smart mobility and traffic solutions. So just a short introduction. For more, visit textport.at. And now back to you, Christian. OK, thanks very much, Alexander, for this short intro on, on Textport. And now we, we don't want to lose any time. So it's, it's now about time for Dr. Non. Uh, the senior expert at transportation, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry, the senior expert at Digital Economy Promotion Agency in Thailand. Most of you will have seen Dr. Non already signing the Memorandum of Understanding on Tuesday with Austrian ATC, Austrian Technology Corporation. So he already played a very important role in, in, this, in those ATDs. But today it's time to, to get an insight from him on an overview on traffic management for smart cities in Southeast Asia. So we are honored to have you here, Dr. Non, and just some, some words to introduce him. So from he's an architect, he's an urban designer, and a smart city research and development R&D specialist. So he has a very deep background in what he's going to tell us about. And currently, he works to advocate concepts and practices of smart, livable cities and implementing them so great honor to have you here, Dr. Non. Floor is yours. Thanks a lot. 
Thank you so much, Alexander and Christian. It's an honor to be here. And of course, I'm really excited to be a keynote speaker. It's my, one of my first times uh, being a keynote on anything, uh, basically, let alone about traffic management, uh, which is the field that I'm not an expert in yet, but I might be here someday. Anyway, so the point that I'm trying to talk to you about today will be about how digitalization and digital transformations could shape and reshape the way we think about traffic management, which is what I like to call a next generation traffic management. So let me start it all with introducing who we are. Why is it that Digital Economy Promotion Agency or DEPA is talking about traffic management? Well, first of all, our agency uh, has been tasked with a very important matters uh, such as Digital Economy and Society, Thailand 4.0, uh, distributions of incomes, and of course, op opportunities and beyond. And because of that, we come up with four missions, starting off with the manpower, because as we know, workforce is most important when it comes to having the right kinds of human resources to work for digital economy. And after which we want to use the workforce to cut up all our industry into the 4.0 version, which means that we wanted to push forward hardware and software, telecommunication, content services. And of course, uh, we are reaching the areas of the uh, metaverse, which we'll be talking about in a bit as well. So that's the industry that are, are pretty much unlimited and open-ended in terms of opportunities. And with that, we hope that it will generate a good economy uh, for the services that will be value added and of course creativity based. But last but definitely not least, to, for the manpower, for the industry, for the economy to work seamlessly, we need the so-called ecosystem. And for us, it's the city for one reason though. Uh, it has to do with the fact that people are moving into the cities more than ever and digital economy is concentrating in the urban areas more than ever before as well. And that has to do with the nature of the economy itself, activities and how urban terrains cu cultivate, incubate, and of course uh, have the potential to of catapulting the next generation industry into reality. That's why we need smart cities of which uh, smart mobility is one of the seven domains, along with smart environment, smart energy, smart economy, uh, smart people, smart living, and of course, smart governance. And that's the reason why Deepa is talking about traffic management. That's why I'm here to talking about traffic management. So Deepa at the moment, uh, it's in the middle of this uh, graph that you see in, uh, on top here. We are in the middle of the uh, policy um, implementations and uh, demand side, which are the cities who wanted to become smarter. And of course, the supply side, which are technologies and those who are willing to use their technological prowess in order to help cities become better in conjunction with the, with the policy from, from above. And at the moment, uh, because DEPA is also the secretariat of the National Steering Committee on Smart City, as well as the uh, Smart City Office, we are uh, serving as a hub in the middle, as you can see from the football uh, in, in, in the picture below that connects not only public sector, but also federal government, also the private sectors, uh, university and academic institutions, and of course, external partners like ATC and of course, Austrian embassy as a whole. So now I hope that I paint the picture of how it is that uh, we deem digitalization so important. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. Why is it that traffic management from now on will be digitalized? So, well, first of all, let me ta start talking about three facts about digitalization, which uh, I summarize this for you here uh, on your right, left-hand side. Uh, first of all, digitalization has been the name of the game for at least a decade now, but COVID-19 just kind of pushed it all the way to the limits. The fact that we are able to talk with the conference call so sharply and so accurately like this uh, with very low latency it has to do with the fact that a lot of technologies got uh, pushed to the limit, pushed to the boundary, uh, thanks to what happened with the travel restrictions that uh, enable us to uh, be, be at home uh, and still able to be productive. And I think uh, COVID-19 sort of helps to accelerate the digitalizations, even though it's already been in the process of making for a while already. Then COVID-19 too uh, makes digitalization cheaper and better. As we know, market economy is usually good for competitions when we have more than two companies or uh, help, uh, kind of competing with one another. What we get as consumers are usually the best technology at the lowest possible pricing, sometimes even free. But you know, as a lot of people said, everything that is free is because we are uh, to be consumed as, as in uh, Facebook or social media that even though we get access to them for free, we, our data are being consumed by, uh, by those algorithms in order to make uh, uh, ad um, uh, targetings to us. But anyway, that's uh, the topic for another time. But COVID-19, what I'm trying to say is that allow the competitions uh, to play 
play an important role in accelerating the digitalization process even faster than ever. And eventually, what we're talking about here is that the recovery efforts which we are facing right now, which we are working together, struggling together right now, will be digital. And that is an absolute fact about what's going on here in the world. And because of these three facts, I'd like to talk about the three plus one trends uh, that we are facing today. Well, first of all, the trends are quite clear. We, we are already living in a cashless, uh, contactless, paperless, officeless, schoolless, right? And a lot of things are going to become less as well. And that has to do with the fact that, as you can see from the left-hand side here, digitalizations make it possible, without which we wouldn't be able to have all these physical list activities. And that could be a good thing, right? Especially in mobilities. Uh, I just attended one of the important meetings in, in uh, carbon emissions the, the other day. And one of the statistics I saw was that most of the pollutions and most of the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from uh, personal vehicles, come from uh, the kind of individual mobilities. And if we can cut that, uh, not, even, not a lot, even by 5%, we can cut greenhouse gases by a large portion. So if we can move less, but still be productive, I think that's the name of the game. And the second point, trends, has to do with the fact that we are moving towards, because thanks to the, all the less you know, from the first point, everything will become as a service as opposed to as infrastructure. So you, you need more roads because traffic's congested. Well, maybe you can think twice and come back to the drawing board and say, maybe you don't need more roads. But what we need is a service uh, provisions that allow people to be able to access the same services without having to be more roads by adjusting number of roads of the car on the day things like that. And that's what we call everything as a service rather than infrastructure as a service. And the third point has to do with the fact that because we cannot see each other anymore, all the companies and organizations would have to shift towards outcome oriented rather than process oriented. Bureaucracies have to be cut, of course, because you can't uh, tell people to be in office eight hours a day. We're going to be moving towards the ideas of uh, using outcome as a key performance indicator rather than the process. And eventually the plus one thing that I, I wasn't sure whether it, was, it should be one of the trends yet because it's so new, that's why I put it as in three plus one, is a seamless blending between the virtual and the physical world uh, or what we use today uh, the term metaverse or convergence technology or even digital. So I'd like to kind of put this uh, as one of the main points that we like, I like to discuss if, if you have enough time afterwards. So let's start right into the ideas and topics of, of traffic management after I already kind of painted the two pictures of why uh, DEPA is important in, in driving economy in Southeast Asia. And of course, uh, why is it that we are living in the era whereby digitalization is everything. So trend one is about last mile mobility has been proven uh, many times that Last mile mobility is not last in terms of it's important. It's actually the first, the most important elements. There are many research that shows that it doesn't matter how good your public transit system are. If you don't have the last mile, everything will collapse because people abandon tra uh, public transit if they cannot get from where they are to the public transit nodes. So if there are no public transit nodes uh, from, the, from the front door, they just abandon the whole thing and take their cars out anyway. And that's why last mile mobility become not just a very important matter, but the jigsaw, the cornerstone, the capstone, the echelons of, of, of the traffic management as a whole. So I wanted to uh, let you guys think about the implications of why is it so important and how we can push this together. The implication of which is that we have to get the public and private to work together in terms of finding the right business model for the last mile mobility. You think about Southeast Asia and how the urban structure in Southeast Asia uh, are like. Uh, similarities are, are to be seen here. Uh, we have the main roads and then we have a lot of crisscrossing alleyways into the deeper parts of the cul-de-sacs. And that's it's a problem because if people have to get out of the cul-de-sacs that takes about one kilometer to the main roads, they will just drive anyway. And that's why the public private partnerships that will bring these people out to the main transit nodes would be the one that could actually improve the condition of public transit as a whole. And then we need a robust business model as well for this to work. Uh, we can see a lot of business model that doesn't work, especially in places whereby uh, competitions actually leads to negative externalities and what uh, Garrett Hardin called the tragedies of the commons. We don't want that. We want the kinds of business model that balances between the positive and potentially negative uh, externalities uh, for uh, something that uh, might outweigh the kinds of pollutions and, and greenhouse gases and congestion accidents that we uh, don't want uh, to override and over rule the livability of the city and eventually we need people to be aware of this so one of the examples that i like a lot is the beam e-scooter 
with uh, rocking Malaysia at the moment. So I got these slides from Beam uh, as of yesterday. They sent me this information now. Uh, Beam has been one of the most uh, rapid growing startup in the world, in the history of startup actually, and is uh, rocking Malaysia, uh, which has the same similar structure of the urban forms as in uh, cities like Bangkok, where last mile mobility is key. So hopefully with the way in which they built their infrastructure and devices, and of course the business models to work with the people, that will lead to more people wanting to uh, in engage and then enhance their experiences with the last mile mobility. The second point, the second trend is sharing economy. It is quite, quite clear that if you want to reduce number of accidents, uh, greenhouse gas, and economic loss due to congestion, we need to reduce number of cars on the roads. And that's statistically to be social facts and mathematical facts as well. So uh, the implication of that is quite clear. First of all, we need the integrated uh, master plannings of mobility plan so that the people can actually get access to the right, uh, people could get access to the supply and the supply can get access to the demand. Pretty much a platform economy whereby people can share their rights with the sense of trust. And when we talk about the sense, sense, sense of trust, there are many technologies today that could be very useful. For instance, uh, blockchain could actually help in verifying riders and, and drivers and therefore the kinds of the business uh, um, operationalities and activities uh, that could be stored in blockchain in order to provide a very, very accurate re records and, stati and statistics of the trustability and accountability of both parties that are sharing the economy in this matter. So that's would let would lead to would lead to the kinds of uh, e-commerce platform that allow the right split splitting and data mining, especially geo mining, to be part of the larger big data analytics in order to drive the sharing economy as a whole. So one of the projects that we are working at the moment in Phuket, for instance, is the mobility as a service. So what we're trying to do is to connect the entire Andaman corridor. So Phuket, you all know for sure. Uh, Phuket, Panga, uh, Gabi and uh, Samui, uh, many uh, small little islands also on the corridor. We wanted people to be able to land in one of these uh, cities uh, in one of the three airports. And from there, they can go to the cities, they can go between provinces and islands uh, using all modes of transportation uh, from cars, from private vehicles, from taxi, from buses, to e-scooters, to motorbikes, of course, to boats. Uh, once this is uh, connected, and we are connecting them as we speak, uh, people will be able to seamlessly travel between uh, one, uh, point one and point B, and therefore, they will spur economic growth for the entire region. Again, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that the traffic management here is, has nothing to do with infrastructure yet. There might be a few, a few percentage that infrastructure has to be good enough for these to take place. But more or less, we are talking about the digitalizations of data so that demand and supply could meet seamlessly and conveniently. The other projects that we are working at the moment uh, is in the uh, province of uh, Kankan. And that's when we are thinking about connecting the main spine at Kankan, as you know, will be the first cities outside of Bangkok to get the public transit system uh, in terms of light rail. So with that, we wanted light rail system to be the transit oriented development mode uh, for the cities to grow to, in terms of urban development. But we also want that to serve as a main feeder for other types of transportation to be connected to the main spine in order to provide seamless transportation experiences as well. And that we are working closely with the Kankan province uh, and also the Kankan Living Lab group who who are actually using the cities in a very creative way to find the balance between the innovation that, that people can absorb and of course the kind of traditional understandings of what transportation should be. Third trend, this is quite exciting. It has to do with the idea of 15 minute cities. Uh, as you may have heard from, from places like Paris that announces it will be the first to build this sort of compact cities idea. Uh, well, the idea is, is quite, uh, it, it, interesting, um, existing cities must be repurposed and new cities must be redesigned to provide necessary services within walking distances. So I just wanna show you this diagram. I love this. Uh, from what we had from 18th, 19th century all the way until, until probably yesterday, the idea is that uh, private cars takes uh, precedence. Private cars is hierarchically more important than any other forms of services. And then walking is of course at the top of the pyramid, meaning that it is not uh, given importance at all. 
within the ideas of uh, 15 minute cities, we wanted to revert, we wanted, we wanted to make this pyramid completely inverted by making walking more important than ever. Because as you know, walking is, is very important in terms of health. It is very important in, in lessening traffic congestion, lessening uh, carbon footprints. And of course, uh, walking is always good when it comes to the ideas of urban management, because you can actually get people to get access to public services. So it's become more inclusive. And of course, it become more responsible uh, socially. Send walking and cycling become the most important modes of moving and then public transport and then private cars in case you really needed them. So when you make the pyramid completely inverted like this, the idea is that it is to bring together people and to bring together all, all the services into the distances of 15 minutes. And I think this is a great idea because it actually allows uh, all of us to distribute all kinds of services to more people so that they can get access uh, to these services easier. And of course, it's gonna have a lot of implementations uh, that would lead to implications in terms of how we reorganize our traffic management model uh, modalities. And the fourth one, the most exciting one actually for me is, is the metaverse. Well, metaverse will transform the way we live, learn, work, and play for sure. Like this guy, right? He's just uh, uh, wearing the goggle and then he's uh, on his uh, console remote control and he's somewhere else. He's not on the basketball court as we see him right now, right? So what happened is that metaverse may decrease our demand for personal mobility because you can be uh, in the comfort of your couch, but then you can be wearing goggles and be in Vienna at the moment, you know, listening to one of the best best orchestra in the world in Vienna. Uh, but then you are in the comfort of your room in Bangkok, right? So you don't have to travel anymore. So that's a great thing about the metaverse. It, it would decrease a lot of carbon footprint. And, but on the other hand, you still need to eat. So there will be increasing demand for the digital, which is the physical, physical plus digital uh, technologies and services such as delivery so that you can get food uh, while you are enjoying the opera and of course the orchestra in the simulation of the Vienna Opera Hall. Anyway, the implication of which is quite simple. Work from home, work vacation, digital nomads work anywhere will become uh, something of a norm new technology and innovations will will play a huge role and there'll be the rise of digital assets in terms of how uh, we purchase and buy and, and of course think about the ownership of things and of course new protocol for cyber security have to be there to make sure that all this work together so I'm, I know I'm running out of time, basically, but uh, as you know, I try to fit as many things as, as I can into this 20 minutes. Uh, the ideas of metaverse uh, is definitely going to be a big one, uh, because if you look at this graph, you realize is that a routine works will, will disappear, uh, will be replaced by automation. Manual work will disappear as well. It'd be replaced by co uh, cognitive capacities, um, automated ability. And therefore we need metaverse in order to be able to work in a, in a cognitive based non-routine fashion. And to, to make metaverse uh, not so dystopians, because if you've seen movies like The Matrix or Ready Player One, you realize that it could be really bad for, for people who, uh, you know, with their phones, they spend eight hours and nine hours a day already on those things, right? But so my argument here is that, well, if you can actually give people the right mindset, the right competency, right sense of control as in relatedness to what they are doing and right engagement, you can actually increase the way in which people uh, uh, pertain uh, to their goals and of course be more, much more in the flow when they're engaged in the metaverse as a form of work, live, learn, and play. And one of the partners of, of Deepa, uh, KMITL, which is the MIT of, of Bangkok, of Thailand, is working on the Interactive Design Center, which has uh, already been renamed the Metaverse Center, to bring all this technology into the forefront of the digital uh, viability here in Thailand. So just to conclude, um, the guidelines for, I, I don't know whether all these, whether any of these are traffic management uh, guidelines at all, but I just kind of want to put it out anyway. I think we need to rethink and redesign everything as a service. Think about 15 minute city. Uh, I know that Sweden is aiming for one minute city. Well, that's a very ambitious goal, but I think they can do it because the whole idea is to make all the, all, every space in the city adjustable to different purposes whenever they need it to be. So the new standards uh, for trust would have to be created if you want a certification of things. Uh, would blockchain be part of it? It ha probably has to be. How would you engage with the uh, digital assets when it comes to working uh, from home and engage in the metaverse and digital world? Incentives and campaigns, of course, very important. We need more data and data has have to be accurate. You have to have veracity, a veracity, a volume, a velocity, and of course, you have to have enough variety so that the big, big data can, can lead to viability and of course, value. And eventually, all these wouldn't work at all if we rely on all business models, right? New challenges need innovative methods and innovative models to work with it. That's why we're going to try to have, we're gonna have to come up together with a new business model to work on this together. 
So I'm congratulate. Uh, I want to congratulate uh, uh, everyone here from Thailand uh, for pushing our smart cities uh, to become at least um, uh, what do you call it the uh, the endorsed smart cities. Fifteen of them are on the list here. Chiang Mai, uh, Chiang Mai University, Mamaw in Lampang, Nakhon Sawan, Khon Kaen, Samyan, and Paramsi in Bangkok, Phuong uh, Phu Dung Kung in Bangkok, Makassan, and uh, many other provinces, as you can see in this picture, these are uh, endorsed as a first batch of smart cities, and they will get coordinated efforts uh, from all the ministry in order to become smart cities. If you don't have enough already in terms of uh, what it is that we talk about, we talk about smart cities, I invited you to look into our smart city handbook, uh, which we produced uh, as of a couple of years ago with the help from the UK embassy here in Bangkok. So you can download from this. And then if you wanted to learn more, taking a course, we have a, a chief smart city officer course that you can take right now. It's only in Thai, uh, but it's it's very exciting course, about six hours. And once you, you, you enroll and, and uh, take exams, you get the certificates at the end as the chief smart city officer of Thailand. All right, so I hope that's um, give you enough of the uh, understanding, my understanding actually, because I am not an expert in traffic management. I hope I will become someday, but I hope that give you enough uh, understandings of what we're talking about when we're talking about smart city, smart mobility, and how you might think about the next generation uh, traffic management. And here's my email. Please contact me anytime. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Non, for this really well. I, I, I can rather say it, it was quite overwhelming because there, there were so many new thoughts that maybe also frightened perhaps some people uh, which, which have to deal with. But I, I think the essence of what you said, we need smart people uh, to deal with less, uh, less space, less time, less traffic, less congestion. And we get everything as a service and we, we, we perhaps need to turn everything upside down. I, I think that's, that's my takeaway. So thanks very much for really giving us this, this whole overview picture, this very lively picture and also this very positive picture of, of our near future. So thank you very much for the, for the time being. Thanks for being here. And now it's, it's time to hand over to the second speak, uh, speaker, to the second keynote speaker, Dr. Dietrich Leis, uh, who will give us an insight on Austrian technology for traffic solutions. So he's also working at FFG. He's the senior expert at transportation systems at FFG, the Austrian Research Promotion Agency. And we're also very happy to have him here, not only because he's at, he's at FFG or he's working at FFG, but he's one of the senior experts uh, in, in Austria on traffic solution, traffic management. He did not only work in research, he worked in industry. He also was an advisor to the European Commission. So he is uh, the man with uh, a very broad experience and we are very curious to hear you, Dietrich. Thanks very much for being here. And I, I, I saw that you were nodding to a lot of things that Dr. Non said. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I will uh, walk a quite similar path. But may I ask you to release the screen so that I can share my uh, screen? Dr. Non, would you, would you please stop the... Yeah, okay. So. Dr. Lyce, it's fine for you. I think you could. Yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. I hope you can see uh, the Great. screen now. It's here. Thanks a lot. Perfect. Yeah, when I uh, was a boy like that, I had the dream of uh, becoming an engineer, a technician, uh, because I had the true belief that uh, uh, technology can solve uh, so many problems in the world. Um, when I was an engineer, um, I wasn't in the position to do that, but uh, it took a while to realize that. Um, issues that were solved were not the problem at all, at least some of them. And it took even longer to recognize that uh, technology and using technology to solve problems is just a part of a story that is much uh, bigger. Um, it's about the people, it's about uh, the interaction of people, uh, their beliefs, uh, and so on. And uh, my presentation is a bit of this story. So if you ask uh, a mayor or a city administration um, if a technology does make a city smart, um, there are various answers. And uh, the answer is maybe. Um, <clears throat> what I will show you is uh, the experience that we made in Austria, uh, which uh, provides a perfect ecosystem for new technologies and mobility solutions uh, that uh, might be emerged 
Um, I think that a solution providers learn in Austria is uh, that you have to bring together a variety of diverging stakeholders with uh, diverging interests, even contradicting interests, to deliver not just a technology, but a solution that fits. Yeah, so um, I hope it, yes, it does work. Um, one uh, 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 experience uh, that I made is, if, if it's about people, if it, it's about city administrations and citizens in the cities, there is an association in Austria, which is called Stadt Marketing Austria, which is uh, translated into city marketing. Um, if you ask mayors, if they want a smart city, they rather opt to have a vibrant city for its citizens and businesses. And uh, City Marketing Austria aims to integrate all relevant areas, actors and institutions that contribute to a unique identity of a city. And the identity of a city is important because that is uh, uh, telling the people the reason why they live there, why they like it, why they love it. It's uh, the identity is the reason for businesses and companies to have their headquarters. So they have their, uh, their locations there and to interact in a prosperous way. So um, Stadt Marketing aims to develop a city brand for the respective city that defines success patterns, okay, and strategic action fields. Um, and uh, the goal is a livable and prosperous city. So if you live, uh, look at uh, the indicators of Stadt Marketing Austria, it's, uh, it, it's uh, covering more or less all areas of living. So we have their economy with uh, attractiveness for company locations, strong trade, yeah, it's also about uh, employment or unemployment. We have as well culture. Yeah, so the cultural offering to people is important. So this is the re um, might be an important reason why people are there and are happy. We have societal issues. Yeah, it's childcare facilities, for instance, low criminality, tolerance. Of, uh, we have the built environment, of course, something that is uh, um, maybe not as hard to change as the societal issues, uh, but uh, you can do it. District development, urban development, uh, architectonic diversity, and finally people. It's about people to get around by public transport. Yeah, It's about people who find doctors, medical care, uh, interaction with, uh, with other people, environmental, uh, a good environmental uh, surrounding and so on and so forth. And if you ask, okay, what's, what has this to do with mobility? I can clearly say it's not all about mobility, but some aspects are about mobility. And this I can show you here. Um, just uh, some issues are strong related to mobility, others aren't that strong, but, but there is a relation. So let me start with uh, top left, innovation to be attractive as a company location. Yes, uh, it is important uh, to get people uh, to work. It uh, could be digital, yes, this is a new trend, but they need to be there anyway. And uh, social interaction still is an important uh, factor. Um, social interaction in, 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 in the real environment. Uh, sometimes if, if it's about production uh, capabilities, uh, you need to get the people there anyway. But uh, for companies, it's uh, relevant to have uh, logistics chains that are not uh, too expensive, that are effective, effective and efficient. So there you can see it's about mobility, strong trade the same. So if uh, uh, logistics is stuck into congestion, uh, retail prices go up, which curbs trade, of course. Um, criminality, of course, is not an issue of mobility, but mobility plays a role in uh, reducing criminality. Let's say if the mobility system is transparent, it's open, there are many people around and you're not alone. Okay, this curbs criminality as well. Um, built environment, okay, I'll come to this a little later. Public transport, of course. And uh, as uh, a doctor not mentioned, um, congestion uh, and, and uh, individual transport is a factor of environmental pollution. So you can see um, if a city administration tries uh, to become a smart city, becomes to be an attractive city for its citizens and its businesses, they have to tackle also mobility issues. 
but it's not just only. So this is this is uh, the point that I want to raise. But now we we dive into mobility. There is uh, a second source that I want uh, to present to you. There is a Swiss uh, Swiss organization. Yeah, it's uh, the World Business Council and Sustainable Development. Um, there is uh, the contact data uh, you have there. And a couple of years ago, they published um, indicators uh, that uh, measure, uh, that can be used to measure the degree of sustainability of the transfer system. And uh, these indicators are, mm, yeah, it, it, they can be used to, uh, to gain the status quo of the mobility system, but also to accompany measures to improve the sustainability of urban mobility. And what, uh, <clears throat> what they did uh, was to define 19 plus parameters. So it's 19 core parameters and some more parameters that, uh, that are a little farther away from the core, uh, but that uh, deal about the mobility. Uh, and uh, we can divide them into four domains. And uh, the four domains are the public space. So, so the ambient, if, if you go out of your house, it's about a clean air and carbon emissions. I put this together. So these four domains are sorted by myself. I cannot go through all of these 19 plus indicators. Um, it's about the accessibility of the mobility system <clears throat> and accessibility to city quarters. Um, sounds uh, similar, but it's, it's yeah, it, there are some differences. And uh, what I try for the rest of, uh, of, of the time today is uh, to bring um, act, um, actual um, developments into relations of uh, these parameters. Um, city uh, administrations already started to use indicators like that to improve their mobility system, um, but not only their mobility system to, uh, to gain um, a better life in the cities. So let me start with, with the first one, the public space, just four of the indicators that uh, fall into this domain. It's um, all about the access to mobility services. So if you think of uh, far distant remote uh, city areas, slums, favelas, and so on, they don't have access to mobility service at all. Um, so what you can measure is the share of population with appropriate access to the mobility services. And what Dr. Nunn mentioned before, the micromobility is, is one of the issues in there. But it's also the, the quality of public area, the second one. Yeah? Is it attractive to be there? Is it attractive to be outside, to meet people, to interact, to have a social interaction with other people? Is it attractive to walk? Um, so the, the 15 minute city that uh, was mentioned uh, before uh, goes hand in hand with, uh, with the attractiveness of a public uh, place. Because if you don't work, walk, because it's not attractive enough, because it's loud, it's stinky, it, uh, you don't do that. And finally, uh, the third one is mobility space usage. And this goes, this is a little, it's very close to, to the attractiveness of, of, of city uh, spaces. So if you have to walk along a broad and loud city, you don't like that. Yeah? But it's an important factor. So the proportion of land use uh, taken by the city transport modes, so urban highways, motorways, uh, yeah, it, 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 this, uh, this makes a city attractive or not. You can measure that. You can work on that. And uh, one of the consequences is regaining of, of, of public space uh, for, for your citizens. So take it away from, uh, from cars and give it back. So the last picture on Dr. Nunn's presentation, it, uh, yeah, it, it's exactly that. Yeah, and finally, the opportunity to active mobility. So the, the picture shown here, so it's, it's, it's an issue of micromobility. Yeah, uh, not only of micromobility, but active mobility. Some people deliberately use active mobility because it's healthy, even though it takes longer. So let me show you some of the, of the ideas here. Um, it's not about just uh, finding public space that is just attractive. So a park or recreation area is attractive, but you don't live there. So what you need is attractive uh, ambient plus everything that you need in walking distance. So if, if, if the city administration uh, aims at this, uh, it's uh, a lot of things to do. It's a lot of consequences. Yeah, it's, it's technology. 
but uh, but also changing the built environment. And um, you can say it's bringing existing approaches, but also new approaches and new technologies into a new governance uh, context. So uh, city administrations take issues in their hands because they actively want to create uh, the public space. Typical approaches and technologies. Um, we have that before, but, but there are some new. It's mobility hubs. So if you think about uh, suburban municipalities, um, they come, people come in into the cities and, and they have to change modes. So they need, they need hubs to do that. You also have automated mobility. Uh, we don't have it yet, but uh, technological developments aim at this, uh, which could play a role in last mile considerations. Um, we have uh, demand-oriented uh, public transportation, which is micro-mobility, of course. But uh, if, if you want to have your public transportation demand-oriented, you need to know the demand. So the consequence is that you have to measure demand. Yeah, it's but also something completely different, super blocks. So define um, city quarters as a super block. And okay, I want to have everything that uh, people need within this block. So it's maybe 500 times 500 meters. So depending on, on, on the topology of the city, you have to also tackle logistics. Yeah, it's um, logistics that they take some place and and uh, and to take public space, but eventually they participate in the public space in a prosperous way. Yeah, and finally, digitalized participation. This is an experience that we made in Austria quite well. Um, if you want to change uh, the city environment, you have to ask the people: so What do you really want? What do you really need? Um, you, have, you can ask. But uh, you cannot access that many people. So you have to digitalize participation. Give people an option uh, to vote or to state, uh, to play statements whenever they want, wherever they want. But, but it's, it's, it's their ambient. And by digitalizing participation, people get back uh, the public space, at least in a virtual way. So they identify themselves with that. So let's change to the second one more technological issue. It's about accessibility of the mobility system. Just uh, four indicators of that. Uh, one is the affordability of public transport for the poorest group. Yeah, it's not affordability for all, it's uh, for the poorest group because you don't want to bring them to private cars. And this is the best way to, to keep them uh, poor. Um, if you look at London 150 years ago, when they introduced uh, the, uh, the subway uh, system, uh, prosperity in the city uh, increased. Why? Because people had a free cho a choice of, um, of the breaking place. So they were not bound to the work at the place where they lived. So they could earn more. And then this was key for prosperity. The lessons learned from, from London. Um, yeah, we have accessibility for mobility impaired uh, groups, of course. Um, deficiency groups, it's important to include. Um, a third one is uh, general, generally the access uh, to mobility services, um, not to public space as, as we had before, but to mobility services. So the picture you can see here is a cable a car that uh, links a favela in, uh, in Brazil uh, to, to the downtown area. So this was a political decision to, to have that, to give people who live there an opportunity to participate in public life. And finally, security. Security, if, if, if there is a bad security le level in the public space or in public transportation, people don't use public transportation at all. So you have to tackle that. Again, um, some thoughts on that. Uh, it's about public investments into infrastructure, but also into connectivity, into fares, and into service quality. Um, sounds simple, but uh, is expensive. Um, city budgets are limited, we know. So you clearly have uh, to track what exactly do you want. And that's the reason why we have these indicators. At least here, you, you see, you cannot buy all that is necessary, all that you think of. You have uh, to go the way by measuring um, the indicators that, you, that are important for a city. Maybe a city has a quite fair security, so you don't need to change that, but the access of certain city quarters is bad. Yeah, so, okay, then you know, you have to work there. Um, 
it's it's about the affordability for the municipalities. So uh, to, to conclude uh, this uh, this uh, this slide, and th here is also where technology can help because. Um, Public investment it costs money, and you have to to get the money somehow back. Yeah, this is this is important. If you can't afford, you can't invest. So uh, sources of revenues have to be explored, uh, such as congestion charges. Um, you have uh, you have quite a fair example of congestion charging in Singapore, but but uh, it's uh, taking place uh, throughout the world. Um, but also park pricing and so on and so forth. Um, some cities go the way uh, to finance a uh, public transport service that is for free for the citizens. And, and this is financed uh, by congestion charge and park pricing. Yeah, this, is, this, is, uh, this is a possibility. But if you talk about congestion charge, it's a technological approach. Um, so uh, just to mention some of the approaches we have there, it's uh, yeah, the same as, as Dr. Nunn uh, says, it's, it's about digitalization. Uh, digitalization can uh, help to cut cost uh, and can help to enhance the service quality. So this, it, this is important, yeah? uh, become digital and uh, you can do uh, more for less. So more service for less money. Another issue is um, uh, a mobility budget. So if people get a certain mobility budget, which could be uh, publicly funded, they can use it appropriately. So a uh, mobility budget can be used uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, use public transport for half of the year. So the second half of the year is uh, you have to pay on your own. Um, you can use it for for 200 rides with micro mobility, and you can use it for let's say 20 days of access in the city with a private car. So then the budget is is gone. Um, so ideas like that, uh, where blockchain play a role, um, are being experienced in Austria uh, quite well, but it's still a, a, a topic of research. Um, people are not used that much uh, uh, to have, uh, so, so the broad, uh, the broad uh, public doesn't have experience to use a blockchain technology. So um, they don't understand, but it's not necessary that they understand. It's, it's about the service. And this is the, the research question at the moment, how to bring it uh, into the people. And finally, mass integration. It's, uh, let's stay with the mobility as a service. And mass integration means that we have the, the huge uh, public service providers. Um, they have mass already, but you need to link uh, operators of the last mile, maybe of suburban municipalities. Maybe they want to become part of mass as well to fund the link uh, for the last mile for their citizens. Yeah, this and, and this is actually uh, taking place in Austria. We can uh, we have uh, certain uh, projects on that. Yeah, and finally, uh, what is important for municipalities is about decision support systems. So as Dr. Nguyen said, you need data, you need precise and accurate and actual data. So this is important. And then you have a basis for decision support. Um, for instance, if you want uh, not just to have investment, but if you want to have investment that meet uh, people's demand, you need uh, to have exactly uh, information about user needs. So. Who lives where with which mobility needs? Is it old age pensioners? Is it uh, low income groups? Is it high income groups? Is it students, pupils, whatever? Yeah, so you need to have information about and you need to have information of what, uh, which transport means they are using, um, which opportunities they have, uh, but also about uh, socioeconomic uh, information. So why don't they use uh, the, uh, the options they, uh, they have? So I have to hurry up a little bit, but this is possible because. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Clean air and carbon emissions. Um, it's uh, we know that, and I can step through it quite fast. It's about air pollution, of course. Air pollution um, is if if uh, air is polluted, uh, uh, people hate it. Yeah, this uh, if you ask them, they know that. Yeah, and this is a this is a, a quality measure of of of, of cities, but also noise. Noise is important. Yeah, it's an important uh, reason to move away from. Uh, from city centers because it's loud. But uh, if people move away from city centers, huh, you lose your 15 minutes policy. So this is this is uh, a part. And finally, greenhouse uh, gas emissions. Um, okay, the Paris uh, uh, treaty answer. 
Um, I have some remarks and uh, to keep it short, I, I knew that I would run out of time. So I, I put it to the next slide. And finally, uh, the accessibility of city quarters. Um, when I, when I talked to mayors, I asked them, how many cars do you want to have? And they said, less, less, less. Yes, you're right. It's about uh, private cars. But if you think about uh, service cars, you want to have more because uh, they keep the city running. So you have to, to, to look quite carefully on, on, on who is using a road for what reason and, and when. And it's about commuting uh, travel time. Yeah, it's uh, and commuting is uh, not only as shown on the picture, it's not about cars, it's in general. If those who use public transport are the winners in commuting travel time, well, they are quite likely to change. Um, yes, the car friendliness of the city center. I once heard city mayors say that everything that <clears throat> makes car usage attractive is uh, to be stopped by uh, cities. Because um, if, if a city center is car friendly, uh, people would use the cars uh, to access the city center. So this is a trend that we can see. And finally, occupancy rate. So it goes uh, to shared mobility. Okay, let's hurry up a, bit, uh, a little bit. Uh, in contrary to the public space issue, here we have the classical logistic and technological approach. Le uh, logistics is cheap. You just need to have a new treaty and it works. Okay, you have to take the, the, uh, the citizens with you. Yeah, this is, is not, uh, it's not uh, simple. Um, but <clears throat> logistics, if you think of modernizing the fleet, it's the service fleet of, of, uh, um, uh, of the city, it's public transport, also taxes that you can do. If you have a taxi, if you want to be, uh, get the taxi license, yeah, you have to take an electric car. So that is what you can do. It's quite simple. Um, but also it's a measures to curb traffic in general. Yeah, park pricing is curbing traffic. So if you get to the city center, but you don't uh, get uh, uh, parking for free and you have to pay and eventually pay a lot, okay, you think twice. Um, congestion charges as we had before or access regulations. So in many European cities, uh, several hundred uh, have access regulation for polluter cars. So if if, uh, if if a car is a polluted car, you cannot access it anymore, and they have to pay fines. Yeah, it's quite uh, quite hurting to people. Um, the stakeholders and, and uh, it's simple to use technology, but it's complicated uh, to implement it because you have to uh, consider a lot of, of of various stakeholders. It's not just the city administrations. You also have to take urban planners. You have technology suppliers, and you have communication specialists because measures to change the accessibility of city quarters hurt people. They do hurt people, we know that. So those are measures for strong politicians. So it's a bit of pill. So you have communication specialists to, to ease the way. Yeah, I think I caught up a little bit. Um, here I am at the end, this is my, my contact information. Um, I hope there was something new, some insights. Um, wish you all the best for the rest of the conference. Okay, so thank you very much. I think you rather made it on time with this two or three minutes more, but uh, thanks for this for this lively presentation. And, and I think also what was really important that you were complementing and extending also the things that Dr. Non, Dr. non already introduced. And, and what I personally uh, think that is really interesting is this measurement exercise that we really need to do. So uh, to, to really make sure sustainable, uh, sustainability works and which works to, uh, in, in which city. So thanks a lot for, for bringing in your experience, your expertise, and yeah, thanks a lot to you, to Dr. Non. And with that having said, I will hand over to Alexander Kiefer for the panel discussion. You're ready, Alexander? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you, Christian. And thank you also from my side to our keynote speakers for giving such a comprehensive overview of the challenges and maybe solutions to these uh, traffic management uh, issues. And I am very interested now to hear uh, the thoughts of our experts and representatives from Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam, who are here with us at this panel discussion. And I will just uh, start with a short round of introductions. Um, first of all, a very warm welcome to Mr. Dr. Karl Ning. Um, he is our expert from Malaysia 
and he is vice president of the Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, which uh, made it their mission to build a thriving national data ecosystem. And uh, using big data and artificial intelligence, uh, Dr. Carl Ning directed uh, numerous programs to apply, apply these uh, data findings to sectors uh, just like uh, transportation or smart city. Um, next up, we have um, Mr. Dr. Sorabit uh, Narupiti from Thailand. Hello. Um, he's our, our, uh, an associate professor at the Department for Civil Engineering at uh, Chula Longkorn University in Thailand, and also a researcher with a strong focus on intelligent transportation systems and sustainable mobility. Happy to have you with us, Dr. Sorovit. And um, our third speaker uh, from uh, Vietnam is Mr. Trung. Um, thank you for, for being with us. And first of all, uh, thank you for promoting our Taxport initiative with your background. This is very, very nice. <laughs> and um, um, he is um, Deputy Director at the Vietnam Posts and Telecommunications Group. He also has a, a background in IT and electronic engineering and more than 20 years of working experience in these fields. And um, from 2018 till now, Mr. Trung uh, has been taking a leading position in national traffic management projects and is therefore a more than fitting expert for our upcoming panel discussion. And joining us from Singapore is uh, Mr. Uh, T. Ni Tang. And um, uh, happy to have you with us. Um, he has a long and impressive history in the transportation and traffic engineering industries. He is a uh, director for traffic design and management at the Land Transport Authority in Singapore. And also a very warm welcome to you from our side. So I will just start with the first question we have today. Um, we already heard uh, a lot of input from our keynote speakers, and I will just uh, forward the first question to um, Mr. Dr. Karl Ning from Malaysia. Uh, what are, in your opinion, the most uh, necessary technologies that Malaysia would need to improve their problems with traffic management? Okay. Um... I look at it from uh, two, two different perspectives. Uh, one, it's the uh, AI-based technology uh, that's able to uh, address, uh, predict driver behavior. Uh, as all of you know, I think the two main problems that uh, Malaysia face is number one is uh, driver behavior, uh, where uh, you know, I think it's quite customized to specific uh, country. Uh, you know, it could be illegal parking, could be, you know, driving uh, uh, emergency lane and so forth. So number one is how do you predict and, and uh, be able to uh, look at uh, driver behavior. The second is the design of infrastructure uh, as well. Uh, for example, uh, you know, how do we uh, collect data uh, to, to look at you know, how to improve a certain uh, traffic congestion in certain area. And lastly, it's the integration of different in, uh, infrastructure. Uh, this includes things like uh, data sharing because we have multiple uh, uh, solutions and systems across different cities. You know, the, the challenge is how do you integrate all of this and to provide a single view uh, for data-driven decision-making and also for uh, tracking purposes, right? So, so those are some of the things that, that we have done. Uh, uh, and I think uh, we welcome uh, the use of uh, piloting different technologies in, in uh, our cities especially in the, the, the largest cities like Kuala Lumpur. Uh, and uh, we, we do have a collaboration with Toyota Mobility Foundation uh, with, with various different parties uh, uh, to, to look at data and then also to improve traffic congestion in, in the, the cities in Malaysia. Thank you very much, Mr. Ning. And um, I will just forward uh, the, this question to our speaker from Singapore. Um, just a short notice. I. I uh, had the wrong name for you, uh, Mr. Oichin To. Um, thank you for giving us your insights. Okay, so for Singapore, um, I think uh, for Singapore, we released our land transport master plan 2040 uh, two years ago. And uh, the land transport master plan uh, 2040, it envisaged uh, you know, the use of uh, uh, 
active mobility. Active mobility means uh, things like uh, public transport as well as uh, support uh, of uh, you know, cycling. Uh, and, and this uh, creates a tension on the roads uh, between bicycles and cars. So recently, uh, we have been uh, tightening our you know, uh, 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 bicycle policies uh, such that you know, uh, on the roads, there's a maximum length of five riders. Uh, uh, cars, when they are passing by, uh, bicycles uh, they need to provide a passing distance of 1.5 meters. And also, we have been converting uh, existing uh, uh, pedestrian walkways, uh, you know, uh, or rather expanding them, uh, widen them, in order to accommodate uh, more bicycles because, uh, you know, pedestrians and uh, bicycles, uh, they don't go very well with uh, each other. So, uh, we need to give more space, uh, as well as uh, facilitate the coexistence of uh, autonomous and manned vehicles. So, autonomous vehicles is, uh, you know, one area, one, one key area we're looking at. So, you know, uh, so far, all the testing of autonomous vehicles uh, has been in uh, uh, pure traffic, meaning to say uh, only autonomous vehicles. But uh, you know, when you bring them into a, a, a big traffic environment, meaning to say that uh, the main vehicles interact with autonomous vehicles, uh, you know, uh, the behavior is a bit more erratic because, uh, yeah, simply because humans, you, you can't really predict how humans will behave, especially in the uh, existence of autonomous vehicle, especially uh, our experience is that uh, uh, you know, human drivers uh, tend to like to bully uh, autonomous vehicles uh, uh, be simply because uh, the autonomous vehicle can't defend itself, right? So, so another challenge that we face is, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the effort to promote active mobility, we have also been pedestrianizing our roads. Uh, pedestrianizing our roads, meaning to say that we have been converting our roads uh, from roads to, to, to bicycle lanes. So actually, this means that there is less space for, the, for, for roads and, and therefore cars to travel. What, what does this mean in terms of the technologies we need? In terms of technologies that we need, uh, quite obviously, uh, for, for autonomous vehicles, we need uh, you know, technologies such as uh, V2I and V2X. Uh, V2I uh, being a vehicle to infrastructure, uh, and V2X is a vehicle to everything. Basically, the communications uh, infrastructure with, uh, I mean, between vehicles and uh, uh, you know, uh, everything else in the, in the traffic environment. Uh, we also have to uh, you know, consider things like uh, uh, IoT technology. Uh, we have to look at uh, you know, smart uh, lampposts as well as uh, you know, transponders to enable. So, so that, uh, the, the, the V2X uh, is the software, uh, but the IoT will be the hardware. Uh, so it's to enable the vehicles, it's the hardware to enable the vehicles to talk to uh, you know, all of the surrounding infrastructure. And underlying all of that, uh, we have uh, cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is an important concern because you know, when you have uh, everything talking to everything else like that, you, you don't want to have, uh, you know, um, for example, uh, men in the middle attacks, uh, you know, and, and people attack your infrastructure and, you know, uh, you know some of the autonomous vehicles uh, could go rook because of that. And also in our effort to uh, pedestrianize and convert uh, roads to uh, bicycle lanes, actually there's less uh, space for uh, cars to go into. And, and therefore we need uh, better traffic sim simulations and traffic models, you know, to ensure that the pedestrianization does not result in more congestion on the roads. So we need to design our roads uh, better, uh, you know, uh, based on uh, these simulations. These simulations will tell us, you know, uh, for example, the entrance or the ingress to a particular development, uh, can it be, you know, still located on, on that, uh, uh, you know, that, that road ha which has been uh, narrowed down, whether, whether the road can still support the, the, the entry and the ingress point into such developments. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I see that Singapore is uh, having a lot of ideas and doing a lot of action to promote also cycling, which um, I'm also a big cycler myself. So nice to hear that. And um, I will uh, now uh, lead over to Mr. Dr. Uh, Soravit from Thailand. And hello, Mr. Soravit. Maybe you hello. can give us some insight into Thailand's challenges. Okay. Um, in terms of the challenges, I think the short term, I break into two two challenges. One is the short term and one is the long term. So I called uh, the short term uh, road traffic management and also the long term would be mobility management. I think for the, well, for, for the short term, we have problems a lot with the road traffic. And I think we have some unique problems. Like we have a lot of motorcycles in our cities and we have like disordered, unregulated uh, road users. So we have to deal with these kind of problems. And of course, I think traffic jammed, a lot of demand, a lot of cars on the roads. I think this is everywhere. So the challenges for the short term would be how to manage the traffic more efficiently. Uh, our traffic management scheme in 
Bangkok and other cities are quite, uh, let's say, conventional or primitive. We don't have a lot of data. So for the short term, we need a lot of data to reflect the traffic conditions and also uh, vehicle condition, driver conditions and road conditions as well. So with these uh, real-time traffic condition, we could uh, manage the traffic better. The data should be used for the regulated traffic in terms of uh, traffic law enf enforcement as well. And this is the, one of the problems that we see, and this is uh, the challenge in the short term. So um, in, uh, we need some uh, hardware like IoT, either AI or CCTV sensors, either from the road sensors or probe vehicles. Uh, and we want to gather traffic conditions and also incident conditions. We like to link it with the enforcement. And we need uh, data analytic tools. I think uh, someone mentioned about data-driven decision-making. Of course, yes, we need this kind of analytic tools as well. Uh, we can do some uh, traffic system readjustment, uh, short-term, maybe some locally, like retiming traffic signals, or also, also like in the network wide, like uh, the looking at the traffic management scheme one way and all that sort. But I think we have to step further to the mobility management. So our challenge really is how to step up to from the road traffic management into mobility management. We need, we need, we have many challenges, even the practicing organization to take care of the mobility management. And anything counts, like even autonomous last mile vehicles. I hear from the expert from DIPA and also from Austria. I think those things are quite good. Uh, we need more service, we need last mile, and even some, something small like car park management could help so that we can manage traffic demand. And also now is mobility demand so that we can provide not only uh, traffic on the roads, but also mobility to the travelers. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nar uh, so Sorabit. Yes, uh, autonomous, autonomous driving and IoT, these are some keywords um, we heard now a lot. And um, I'm interested in, in the Austrian solutions, which you will um, have the opportunity to discover in our P2P meetings afterwards. But uh, first of all, let's hear our um, speaker from Vietnam, Mr. Trung. Um, what are your challenges um, for traffic management right now? Thank you, Alexander. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm very excited in a new approach from the Dr. Nong and feasible solution from Dr. Derek. Before talking about the challenges, we would like to highlight some positive points about Vietnamese institutions in traffic sector. For example, the Prime Minister had approved for our five national specialized master plan on roads, sea, railway, and inland waterway. The Transport Ministry issued digital transformation program to 2025 and vision to 2030. Now, Moving to challenges part, like all the country, the COVID-19 pandemic in Vietnam has caused a serious decrease in output and revenue, especially passenger transport reduced at least 30%. In terms of traffic order and safety management, still exit the situation of overloaded cargo vehicles, spending, speeding, and driving vehicles without driver license. Besides, traffic accident rate had decreased was still high. Next problem is traffic jam in big city at rush hour. Public transport network and environment protection has not been completed too. Regarding to the challenges in traffic infrastructure management, first, I would like to talk about climate change that we watch and heard a lot on TV or on internet or even on the first day of this event, right? The situation of climate change is very complicated, causing landslides, flooding, destruction of many traffic structures. Next, the planning and deployment of traffic infrastructure maintenance were not implemented well, leading to deterioration of 
road quality, especially national highway and inter-province road, leading to traffic and safety. Besides, road transport still take a high proportion compared to other modes of transport. Finally, the application of science and technology is still slow. For example, the research and implementation of intelligent traffic system projects were only pilot and individual. Our stage just started building a unified and shared database of the transport industry recently. Thank you very much for your insights. Um, thank you for, for raising these uh, issues. Uh, I think this was um, uh, very insightful also for our Austrian participants. And um, uh, for question, uh, question number two, we still have time um, for a short round of, of answers. Um, what do you see um, uh, as the solutions for these, uh, for these um, challenges? And uh, once again, I would lo like to start with uh, Dr. Karl Ning from Malaysia. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, um, when I talk about solution, uh, it has to be uh, look at it from an integrated standpoint. I think number one is uh, you need to make sure that uh, you need to be able to uh, measure um, all the different initiatives within the city, right? Especially the traffic solution. Uh, in a lot of cities, um, uh, this as a, a, a you know a command center. Uh, where it provides uh, integrated uh, uh, visualization of what's happening within, within the city, right? Uh, and one of the challenges in order to do this is uh, data integration uh, from various different uh, 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 sources, from uh, IoT sensors uh, to traffic light, uh, and, and also getting external data as well uh, from, um, you know, uh, uh, right hailing, uh, grab, and so forth. Right. Uh, the challenge here, I mean, uh, it's uh, trying to get different data sources uh, and, and also, um, you know, how to ensure privacy and security of, of, of the system. Right. So, so that's number one. Uh, number two, it's uh, the ability to um, conduct uh, experimentation pilots uh, in a similar sort of fashion. Uh, in a lot of uh, cities, uh, one of the challenge is uh, trying to get approval to do uh, things that are out of norm, right? So, so for information context, we have um, a, a sandbox, a national sandbox, which has been coordinated by a, a different government agency to provide uh, the experimentation uh, and the application of new innovation in, in the smart city context. Right, so so we, we have that happening and we welcome um, you know uh, investors or companies who wants to look at this uh, uh, moving forward so that's the second part the third area which is actually uh, very important it's um, you know when we talk about uh, smart city uh, it's essentially it's also uh, transformation when it comes to it's essentially a transformation because it involves digitization and perspective. So you need to get the, uh, the, the government officials, the city hall, uh, and the right, uh, the whole value chain to, to really understand digitization and how do we uh, ensure that, um, you know, the, the systems and everything it's uh, digitized and the data can be shared so that the benefits of digitization can, um, can be, um, can, can actually, uh, benefit the whole ecosystem and the nation, right? So that, those are the things that we are, we are looking at um, and, um, and hopefully with the, the right support and uh, right collaboration, be able to, to make these things happen. Thank you, Mr. Ning. And thank you also for taking up the keyword of digitalization, which Dr. Nan already has elaborated on quite extensively in his keynote. And uh, Mr. To from Singapore, um, your take on on the possible solutions for Singapore's traffic problems. Uh, th thank you, Alexander. Uh, actually, uh, for Singapore, our solutions uh, are quite uh, similar to that of uh, Malaysia as uh, shared by Dr. Ng earlier. Um, it's uh, mainly in the form of uh, 
he mentioned uh, data integration. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go on top of that and uh, also mention uh, systems integration uh, because you know uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, hardware solutions that uh, we are looking at and a lot of software solutions they're looking at. But you know uh, these uh, hardware and these software, you know they may or may not necessarily interface or talk to each other well. And we actually need um, a lot of uh, uh, effort at the back end uh, to make it happen. Uh, likewise, uh, you know, uh, sensors is an uh, uh, important area as well. So, for example, you know, uh, earlier we were talking about pedestrianization, but in order to, to really uh, achieve pedestrianization, you know, we, we also need to be uh, reasonably certain that, uh, you know, that, that this pedestrianization is uh, feasible and, you know, does not lead to external downstream issues. So, for that, we actually need to uh, have a, a sense of, you know, uh, before and after. So for example, you know, we introduce a new subway line. Uh, naturally, the volume of uh, traffic would, uh, in the area would decrease. But the question is, uh, to what extent uh, has it decreased? So, so for that, we, we actually need to build up our sensor network in order to be able to sense for ourselves uh, whether you know, uh, the, the, the traffic volume has uh, uh, reduced uh, to a certain uh, level such that you know, we can reasonably afford to say uh, we take one entire lane of road and convert it into uh, a bicycle lane. Or, or a pedestrian walkway, for example. So, so, so these are, are some of the things that we are looking at. So, so, and as earlier mentioned, also, you know, uh, we talk about autonomous driving at all. This also requires a very extensive uh, sensor network as well as uh, integrated uh, systems. Uh, so, so these are some of the uh, key technological areas that we're looking at. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Toh. Um, thank you for, for presenting possible solutions. Uh, Dr. Sorovit from Thailand. Yeah, um, yep, um, for me, I think there are two kinds of solutions. I, I start with the non-technical solutions first. I think we need to find someone who, who is responsible for all these matters. And with the practicing organizations at the moment, perhaps they don't, they thought uh, they, they really go in, in this uh, kind of initiatives and solutions. So we need to find someone to, to take care of this business first. But for the technical part, I think, again, uh, for the short term uh, solution, uh, I we rather look at the road traffic management and uh, some data integration, uh, integrated traffic management. I think this is uh, the right solution uh, because perhaps uh, we don't have it in Thailand in the cities yet. But again, we have to move uh, away from the road traffic management when we try to do not only traffic management, but also like uh, manage the demand. So uh, we, we need to gather all this demand and uh, travel demand and try to manage uh, the demand uh, in the same fashion as the traffic demand, which is quite new. Uh, I think this is like uh, the new solution that we have to find out. Thank you. Thank you, very interesting. Um, Mr. Trung from Vietnam, um, you have the last word. Okay, in my opinion, Vietnam is following solution and technology. Firstly, I think data technology such as GIS, open data, cloud and computing, data warehouse and big data. Because this will help build a cutting edge, unify and share traffic database infrastructure. Then support better than better traffic management and operation. Second, ITS, I mean intelligent traffic system need to be comprehensively researched and implemented synchronously. However, some ITS services will probably be deployed in advance, such as calling emergency services, using camera to enforce traffic law, or using auto-adaptive traffic sign. Next, I think it's necessary to prioritize the implementation together of technology such as IoT, surveillance cameras, speed, environment sensor, radar, and AI technology in traffic. Because this combination will help the traffic management, operation, forecast, and prevention of accidents work more effectively, safely, and cleanly. And finally, we also need multimodal transport solution and other technologies to help mitigate the impact of the pandemic to quick recover and grow the traffic and transport industry output and revenue. Thank you. 
Well, thank you all for your takes and for your expertise on these questions on traffic management. Um, we are just on time and I suppose I can speak for my co-host Christian as well in saying that uh, we now have a clear and comprehensive picture of the challenges in traffic management and smart mobility in Southeast Asia. And I'm sure Austrian technology providers listened closely and hopefully you can get in contact with them um, in the B2B meetings after this session. Right, Christian? Exactly. So thanks very much, Alexander, for, for hosting the, the panel discussion. Uh, we, we still have some, some minutes left and there are two questions in the, in the uh, Q&A part. Of, of the webinar tool. And, and it, I, I think they rather address Mr. Mr. To from, from Singapore. So the first, because you also mentioned bicycles, the first one is how do you manage the traffic and environmental impacts of bicycles and motorcycles plying uh, public major roads, which is the first one. And the second one directly to you, uh, currently PMD bicycle and pedestrian is sharing the crosswalk. Is there any strong mandate that this will segment the both to have each lane to stay for guard the citizens. Is there a possibility for you to answer these questions shortly, Mr. To? Uh, yes, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll take the second question first. Um, so um, in, in terms of uh, segmenting the crosswalk, um, I, I think uh, this is uh, something that is not possible. Uh, simply because, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, Singapore, we, we didn't start out with uh, having uh, dedicated bicycle lanes, unlike uh, some other parts of the world. So, uh, you know, uh, organically, the, the bicycles, either they have to take the, 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 the pedestrian walkway, or, or, you know, what you call the crosswalk, or, or they go on the road. So actually, the bicycles are allowed both on the road as well as on the pedestrian walkway. Um, of course, uh, on the road, um, you know, there are certain requirements uh, such as, uh, you know, they need to wear a helmet, uh, they need, uh, you know, a proper uh, front light and back light and all. Um, uh, so, so they can actually choose uh, where they want to go. But uh, naturally, you know, as a cyclist, uh, I, I think even for me uh, personally, you know, for my own safety, i rather go on the pedestrian walkway rather than uh, on the road itself because, uh, you know, uh, some of these uh, drivers, uh, they can be uh, pretty inconsiderate. Uh, you know, and you know, they, they can purposely, deliberately, you know, uh, fight uh, very close to you, you know, just, just to scare you a, a bit, you know, even though you didn't do anything wrong. So, so as a, a cyclist, I would prefer very much to go on the, uh, on the pedestrian walkway. Um, but the question is, uh, uh, you know, sharing of the pedestrian walkway between the pedestrians and uh, cyclists is a problem for us. So I think uh, where possible, uh, uh, you know, uh, lucky for us, you know, uh, in, in, in our town planning earlier, uh, we usually uh, for, uh, when we have a road, you know, uh, we usually build a road, a pedestrian walkway, and what we call a green verge. Green verge is basically uh, where we plant a tree. So there's grass and there's a tree. So, so right now, we are actively exploring, you know, uh, all, all the possible areas where we can encroach upon the green verge. So we basically move the tree a little bit, uh, expand the walkway a little bit, you know, give uh, everyone a, a little more space uh, on the pedestrian walkway to facilitate the coexistence of uh, cyclists as well as uh, pedestrians. Yeah. So, so that's the answer to uh, the, the second question. Uh, as for the first question, uh, the, the, the traffic and environmental impact of bicycles and motorcycles uh, flying the public major routes. Uh, actually, uh, the, 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 the traffic and environmental impact, now, uh, I'll begin with the traffic impact first. Uh, for motorcycles, it isn't a very big problem. Uh, the problem is, is really in uh, bicycles because uh, bicycles are a much uh, slower mode of transport as compared to cars. So, the, the challenge for us is, uh, you know, a lot of a car, a lot of drivers are very upset, you know, when they get stuck behind a bicycle and, you know, um, you know what am I going to do if I start behind a bicycle, right? So, so for that, uh, we have introduced a lot of new legislation, you know, to, to require that, you know, the bicycles, uh, uh, they have a maximum length of, uh, they can only cycle in a maximum uh, file of uh, five riders in a row. But, but more important than that, I think, uh, related to the earlier uh, response to the second question, is we're looking to expand the, the pedestrian walkways to accommodate uh, these uh, cyclists of the pedestrian walkways a, a, a bit more comfortably. So, so that's the traffic impact. As well as the environmental, as for the environmental impact, uh, for bicycles, actually, there's no environmental impact because uh, uh, these are very green mode of transport. Uh, obviously, uh, motorcycles is uh, you know, a separate issue, but uh, under our land transport master plan, uh, we have a plan 
to actively phase out all forms of internal combustion engine vehicles. We are moving all vehicles to electric vehicles and at least good motorcycles as well. So for motorcycles, uh, you know, uh, you know, in the longer term, actually we'll phase out all the, the combustion uh, motorcycles and, re and uh, require that uh, all new registered motorcycles are uh, electric motorcycles. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank, uh, thank you, Mr. To. Thanks very much. I, I just saw that, that we also have in the live chat another question, which is also quite interesting to Dr. Non. I hope you are, you are still able to, to uh, give us two more minutes. Uh, it, it's related to metaverse and, and the killing. Oh, I, 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 just, I just saw that Dr. Non is already on the move. So we will, we will answer this question then uh, by writing. So thanks, thanks very much for that. And yeah, thanks to the panelists, thanks to the speakers, but not just for now, not for today, but also for the last three days. So just to summarize and, and finalize the, this part of the, of the Austrian technology days, I think it, it's time to say a, a big and warm thank you, not just to the speakers, not just to the panelists, but also to the main organizers, which is Alexander Kiefer on the FFG side, Stefan Sota, Christina Stieber, and, and so many others that I can't uh, mention now on, on the sides of uh, Advantage Austria. Also our sponsors, the ministry, uh, namely Gernot Grimm, Michael Lederer, Alexander Unkert, who, who also made a, made a big contribution to make this happen and make this uh, Austrian Tech Days for Southeast Asia a success. Special thanks, of course, to Abigail Stegmüller, who made the technical, who did the technical support and made all that happen. Thanks so much, Abby. Great, great support. Um, thanks to the translators. I mean, I just tried it out recently. It, it really worked out well, perfectly. Thanks so much to them. And finally, again, thanks to all the speakers, panelists and participants and to everybody who made it possible. Please do not forget to join the B2B meetings now. They're about to start in, well, five minutes. So time to uh, grab a coffee or a drink or whatever you need. And that's it for the moment. Thanks a lot. I hope you, had, uh, you could enjoy and we appreciated working with you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All the best. Have a good day.